County Board of Commissioners meeting for August the 2nd, 2021. Uh, Commissioner Marty Pennell will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you would, we'll stand for the invocation. Now I'll ask for a moment of silence in remembrance of uh, Commissioner Jeffrey Peel, who was tragically killed since our last meeting. Lord, we're coming to you at the end of this day. Lord, as we start this meeting, we ask that you direct our thoughts, give us wisdom, the things that we say and do, help us to do things that can move Alexander County forward. And Lord, as we come into this meeting, a lot of things has happened since we met last. Pray for Commissioner Peel's family. Lord, help them in this time of the laws there. And Lord, pray for all those. And thank you for someone that's touched lives as he has all across our county children and involved in other things. Help us to pick up that uh, mail and, and go and uh, just be wise in what we do and make decisions that will help each one. Lord, I pray for our nation, for our president, all the way down to our county commissioners, the police, all those that are looking after emergency services. Help them. Lord, help us to do what's right. And we just thank you day. Thank you for the good things that you do for Alexander County. Lord, as it seems that COVID's coming back around, pray that you protect us from these things. Just give us a, the wit, wisdom that we'll do you know, what is right. And with all this, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Please direct your attention to the flag. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, moving on to our commissioner report. Uh, I'll just say I was really shocked, I'm sure everyone was, when they got the news of uh, Commissioner Peel and the accident, his passing. Uh, was a good friend, a uh, good commissioner, served the county well. I was on the school board when he first came on and we did the interviews there and he was you know, ultimately hired for the county. Uh, be missed greatly, missed by all of us and you know, just continue to pray for his family. And, uh, Uh, Jeff was a pretty good friend of mine. Um, in my opinion, he was a true servant uh, to the kids and to the folks of our county. He was the uh, type of guy that um, you always knew kind of where he stood. He always helped anyone he could. Uh, it was his desire to leave anyone that he touched better than when he came across them. No matter if that was uh, just to help a family out or even help a county out for a short period of time. But he will be truly missed and uh, we love his family greatly. That's correct. And Mr. Vice Chair? Yes. Yes, sir. Commissioner Yoder here. I just want to say that Jeff was a good man, stood up for what he believed in, a uh, Christian man, a man that made a tremendous contribution to Alexander County, to the children that he touched through the public school system, and also at the Christian Academy there at Millersville. Uh, he touched a lot of lives, a lot more lives than I would ever imagine, and the outpouring of love and support for his family, and over the past two weeks has been unbelievable. He's a man that uh, stood up for what he believed in, stood his ground, and he always gave, came to county commissioners meetings well prepared. He read his material, he studied it, and he was a great asset to Alexander County and he will be sorely missed. My prayers continue to go out to the family and uh, uh, this county will, will miss Jeff Peel. Thank you. Yes, sir. They will. Uh, and two, as far as on the county things, I was able to attend a couple 
grand openings uh, in the last uh, couple weeks. Uh, one was in town and uh, town council and uh, Councilman Jack Sims was there also. And I guess that was the uh, <clears throat> the last opening or grand opening that Jeff was you know was in attendance at and uh, got a chance to talk to him and then we had one uh, I can't think is a lawnmower implement uh, grand opening out on Rocky Springs Road. He didn't come but he he texted me and said he wouldn't be there. I said well we got this covered it'll be okay but I texted him back and it's kind of a little inside joke anybody's been with him. I said you're missing the Krispy Kremes and he texts back Oh my! So, you know, uh, he liked to uh, be out in the public, and he liked food, and like whatever he did, he did it heartily, and he enjoyed life, and uh, he will truly be missed. Uh, have you ever report, Mark? No, it's not at this time. Okay. Uh, moving on to the adoption of agenda, I would make that as a motion. Everyone's had the uh, agenda in their booklet. Second. And a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Uh, all right. Thank you, Larry. All right. Uh, first, uh, Mayor of Business is our uh, public comment. And I think uh, Sammy Atkins has signed up to speak. Uh, there will be a the clerk, Jamie, will keep the, as far as the time. If you're the only one speaking, you know, we'll give you time to come up to the podium, if you will, and, and speak. We make no action on anything, but you know, we'll listen it won't, it won't be long. and get back with you. All right. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sammy Adkins. My wife, Frankie, and I would like to express our condolences to the Peel family and the commissioners who lost a fellow member. Now my reason for being here, we have an ongoing problem with the water lines in our Standela modular community. This includes Standela Drive, Gina Lane, and Duane Drive. All are a part of the community. The lines have breached several times in several locations. They are at least 35 years old. The city of Hickory should have a record of the number of times they have had to come for section repairs in our development. This is like putting a small band-aid on a large open wound. The last problem came in a double dose. Vacation day July 4th, then less than two weeks later on July 16th at the very same place. There are 35 homes in our community, and everyone is affected every time this happens. I have heard stories of having to replace flooring and water lines bursting at residences. My hot water heater burst open at the top and sprayed water all over the place. All of this is the result of water pressure building up while it's cut off. I appreciate the promptness of the city of Hickory for doing these section repairs. To be honest, they are probably tired of coming to the same location so many times. I'd like to, th to thank the commissioners for allowing me to have a platform to discuss this important issue. I have 46 signatures on this petition to replace the water lines. <coughs> That's all. <laughs> all right. If you want to just give those to Jamie, the clerk, and she'll put them as record. If you want to, do you need them back? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item number two is a public hearing for approval of road name Holly Tree Lane. Uh, <coughs> Make a motion that we open a public meeting. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Yoder. Motion is carried and approved. Uh, public hearing is open. Uh, 
Yes, sir. Um, staff requests the approval of the uh, name change as listed below in your packet. The name meets regulations as required. The name has been checked for duplication and sound indexing, and the road name is Holly Tree Lane. Its location is Cross Street Blair Road, so it's Holly Tree Lane. Okay. Is there anyone in the audience who wish to speak about this? Okay. Um, no one speaking. We'll close the public hearing. I do have a motion. Second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Uh. Well, thank you, Commissioner Yo. The uh, meeting is closed. Uh, I'd entertain now a, a I'll, well, I'll make a motion that we approve the road name as given. Need a second. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Uh. Thank you, Commissioner Yoder. Motion carries, and it's approved. Um, moving on to our next item, uh, is item number three, public hearing for conditional use case 21 uh, dash five, Daniel and Bess Sarusa. And there's also uh, something I'll read here, an addendum to this. The following agenda item is a conditional use permit application number 21-5 for an outdoor artist market. The board's required to conduct this hearing in a quasi-judicial manner. That means it's like a court hearing. The board's discretion is limited and its decision must be based upon evidence in the record. If you will be speaking as a witness, please focus on the facts and standards not personal preference or opinion. And each one who speaks will need to be uh, sworn in, uh, at, you know, including staff members for testimony. Uh, at this time, I'll make a motion. We open the public hearing for uh, conditional use permit case 21-5. Second. Uh, second. Okay, second, uh, Commissioner Young. Yes. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Young. Okay, public hearing is open. And you want to speak before you come up to the podium? Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the whole truth to the best of your knowledge? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. This is actually a continuation of the conditional use application that we presented at the uh, last board meeting. The board had some questions, and the owner arrived here late. Um, the board also asked that we I go I go out to the site and visibly f look at it. We have I have some photographs that we've taken. Um, the owners have put buffering in. Um, they've also installed gravel since these pictures were taken. Um, the, the buffering meets the requirements as far as the height and whatnot and the, and the species. Um, all on the perimeter and I think the board had some question as to the location of portable sanitary facilities and whatnot and I was unable to answer them so I'll give you Miss Sarusa okay. uh, yeah, I think the uh, the question was the location you know for the, the where would you sanitation. like them? well I think on the map it shows it's on the upper right. corner. Yeah, just because it would probably make it easier when they come to clean them. Okay. But right. if you have another preference, we can, I mean, there's plenty of space out there. Okay. So the pictures, this is all around the surrounding property, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Okay. 16 North is on the other side of the house with the green roof, correct? Is that looking towards 16? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, any commissioner have a question? Any other question? Commissioner Gator? Yes, sir, I'm good. Oh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. On this drawing here, yes, sir. is this supposed to be Highway 16 up here? I'll make sure I've got this turned right in my mind. 
it, it's not labeled, so I'm not positive. So 16 would actually be here. This is coming in the driveway. Okay. Uh, this is, oh no, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so basically, we have two roads coming into the property. We have the one to get to the house and this here. Um, so this here is the driveway. So this along here would be 16. So 16 is on this side of this form. Correct. Okay. Yeah. If Commissioner Panel, if you look at the picture that's up, what you're looking at behind those trees is the county's maintenance facility. Mm -hmm. That is their driveway that comes in off of 16. Okay. And go goes over to the home, mm -hmm. and this big open field that goes to the houses that are on 16 that they've put a buffer in is where they want to have these events. Okay. Okay. Does is there anyone in the audience who has a light like speak? Has to be sworn in, but if there's anyone here, I want to give them an opportunity. Okay, um, no one speaking there. Any other questions? Um, one thing on the porta potty, I think we should move that off of the neighbor's line. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. where the line of trees is there, the lot goes, I think, I don't know, it's another what, how many feet? I have no idea. I think it's another two feet beyond those trees mm -hmm. towards the neighbor's house. Uh, as far as the the pictures, which picture would be the one that would show the closest to where the porta john would be? Is there? I mean, you, you could think? put. I mean, we could put it at that corner coming in under those sort of red maple there. trees there, if you wanted. If that would be easy, um, or it could go on the other side of. The, we've got the map in here, buddy. I mean, if you guys tell me where you want it, we'll make it work. Um, Highway 16 is here, so you've got yeah. the houses mm -hmm. here. You've got the houses yeah. here. So, so and we've got a house and over here. And we've got here. this big parking lot here, so I think we were thinking of, you know, mm -hmm. either here or down south to get over the corner, but we could put it up here too. And your house is up here somewhere? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or we could, you know, put it somewhere. I don't even want to say in the field, but. Um, mm -hmm. I think as long as, for me, as long as we move the porta port potty off of right there at a property line or near a oh neighbor yeah. well, you know what? and over in here, big, that's fine. There's a really big berm up there now. We created a berm to kind of block. I don't know where it's the berm mm -hmm. was, but there's a, yeah. a berm. So he could, so it's like if we're, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, there's, yeah. not enough, I there's not a lot of visibility over that berm mm -hmm. the way the property can cut down. Okay. Well, if you could put it somewhere in between, you know, I think that would work. Just to move it back a little bit before it's not. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Is there uh, any other questions? Any questions, Commissioner Young? Still good? I'm good, yes, sir. Any questions, Mark? Okay. Uh, Make a motion that we close public hearing on the uh, conditional use permit case 21 dash 5. Second the motion. Okay, have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion carries. Okay, uh, might make a motion that we approve conditional use permit 21 dash 5 based on the uh, following recommendations from. Uh, the zoning department. Uh, number one, the Alexander County Environmental Health approval of all relevant sewage disposal and water supply, all solid waste to be contained and disposed of in accordance with the solid waste ordinance. Operating hours be limited to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Operations shall be limited to not more than two days a week. A driveway permit be obtained from NCDOT if required. 
No outside storage of goods or wires shall be allowed beyond operating hours, and that the portage on will be moved a good distance away from the adjoining neighbor's property line. Make that as a motion. Need a second. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. Any discussion? Being none. All in favor, vote the same. Raising the hand. Uh. Okay. Motion carries and it's approved. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to our next item. Item number four is uh, GDX report for 2020. Recognize Alexander County Veterans Service Director, Cherry Kilby. Thank you. Hey. I'm just going to give a quick review of the past fiscal year. The VA has identified 2,283 veterans receiving benefits, financial and otherwise, in Alexander County, and that translates into $25,915,000 in the past fiscal year. The VA breaks that down into compensation and pension, which is what most people think of when they hear VA benefits, and that was paid $12,745,000 to Alexander County veterans. This is an increase of 6.81% from the last year, and these are paid directly to veterans, and they are non-taxed. They additionally paid $651,000 in education benefits. They either are paid directly to the college or they're paid to the families. And then the third breakdown is the health care benefits, which was $12,242,000. This represents health care received as well as funds paid directly to the veterans who may not have otherwise gotten health care. So overall, we've had a, an increase. We're not like blowing it out of the water or anything, but we're not declining either. So, do you guys have any questions? One, how is um, uh, attendance and membership on younger or newly veterans into? Slim to none. They have a lot of outside responsibilities. A lot of them have young children. I mean, you know, we're talking ages five and below. So, they those are their priorities rather than membership in some of the organizations. Good information, and I think it's something that a lot of times we're not aware of, and this gets attention to where they need to be, and mm -hmm. we do appreciate their service and what they've done. Thank you. As far as, and uh, you take that back and tell them the board of commissioners. I will definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Ronnie? Yes. Go ahead. If Chairman. you don't mind, could you ask her a question? Okay. Uh, I, I would like to know if, if if our veterans are getting the receiving the treatments that they should at our veterans hospitals, and if they are able to get in and get the services that they need. I think that's vitally important to our veterans because they work for it, they've earned it, and they've sacrificed. And I just want to make sure that they are getting the treatments that they need in a timely manner. Absolutely, Commissioner Yoder. Um, they do have a prioritization where, um, depending on your age, your health concerns, um, and what is going on with you, you, you get moved to the top of the line. So they do kind of triage you as far as health care goes. Um, but any veteran can actually go to any local facility and the VA will pay for it. They just have to call the VA and say, hey, I went to the emergency room in the past. They have 72 hours to report that. So as long as they report that, then they don't have to drive to an actual VA hospital like in Asheville or Salisbury. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it, and I appreciate what you do for our veterans. And I thoroughly appreciate what the veterans have done and their sacrifice they've made for this country. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, moving on to item number five, Alexander County Resolution authorizing sale of property to Paragon Films. And I recognize Rick French, County Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at our May 24th meeting, uh, commissioners authorized the sale of property to Paragon for the sum of $600,000. In your packet is a resolution that authorizes that sale. Uh, several items are mentioned <coughs> in the resolution. Uh, the fair market value of the property as of the date of this resolution is approximately $500,000 as calculated as calculated by the county. The sale to the company will generate increased property tax revenues over the next 10 years and the Board of Commissioners with this resolution would direct the county to execute a contract uh, 
and any necessary resolutions or agenda between the company and the county under these terms and conditions. So we need a motion, Mr. Chairman, if the board sees fit to approve the resolution as submitted. Okay, thank you, Mr. French. Yes, sir. I make a motion we approve the resolution authorizing sale of property to Paragon Films. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Being none, I entertain a vote by a raised hand and Larry. Aye. Motion carries and the resolution is approved. Thank you, gentlemen. Moving on to item number six, Alexander County Treasurer's History Book. Recognize Mr. Gary Herman, Alexander County Public Information Officer. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioners. It's my pleasure to be here tonight to discuss the Alexander County Treasurer's History Book. If you look at this, that may refresh your memory on what we're discussing. It's a very quality history book. We entered into the county and the EDC entered into an agreement with the Alex History Group, LLC. This goes back to 2012 to fund the printing of this history book. So a total of 2,100 books were printed at a cost of $66,232. Alexander County contributed 51,667 and the EDC contributed 14,565 to the book project. The book was seen as a great way to promote Alexander County and our rich history. Of the 2,100 books that were printed, approximately 1,100 copies were sold. So that leaves us with about 1,000 remaining, a little bit less than that. Um, so we've settled up with Alex History Group, LLC, and received uh, total reimbursements of just a little more over uh, $46,000 and we now have possession of the remaining copies. Uh, and as a side note, the EDC has not received any of the reimbursement uh, from the portion that they submitted. The books were sold by the Taylorsville Times um, at a price of $49.95 plus sales tax. Uh, staff proposes that commissioners set a new lower price for the books that will encourage people to purchase the rest of these high quality history books to help recoup some of the funds. Staff, after speaking with the county manager, uh, we recommend selling the books for $20 each, which would include sales tax, making the transactions easier for the public and for the staff. The actual sale price would be $18.69 plus $131 in sales tax for a total of $20. We've uh, been in discussion with library director Laura Crooks, and she is in agreement to sell the books at all three branches of the Alexander County Library. And also, we could sell books at other county departments that handle cash. Um, a number of the books could also be used for posterity or upcoming events, uh, gifts to dignitaries who are visiting, things of that nature. So um, staff uh, makes a recommendation that we uh, set the price of the history book at $20, which includes sales tax, and sell them at the three branches of the library and other appropriate locations. Any discussion? And uh, sounds like it'd be a good deal. Nice book. It's a very nice book. Very nice book. Hey, Mr. 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 Vice Chair. Yes. Yeah, I, I'd want, I, I'd only want to add one thing to this. Uh, uh, I think the price is good. I think it's great that everybody's going to have these things to the libraries to sell them. But I, I would like to see us hold one case back, one case out of all of those that's left over, uh, so that the next time there's a uh, anniversary of the birthday of the county that we could use those in some way to uh, uh, give those away or do something special uh, on that special day when uh, Alexander County's uh, birthday comes up on a, uh, an anniversary of uh, a, a even year like 150 or 200 or, or, or what the birthday may be at that time uh, to use those to uh, uh, to give, you know, just, just to keep one case just to give away, just as uh, a token from the county when we have our anniversary. Well, a, a case is 12 books, so if you want right. to set maybe a particular number so we would know how many you want to hold back. And the bicentennial would be in 2047. Right, and I think it'd be good just to have that at that time. Yeah, it's a good idea. Okay, well, so we've got almost a thousand copies remaining, so if you want to do a certain number 
and put that in the form of a motion with the price. Mm -hmm. You good with twelve, Commissioner Yo? I'm I'm good if you guys are. It's fine with me. Yes, I I just think it'd be good to have something just held back, just okay. just just as a token from the county at some time on an anniversary. Okay, that sounds good. Um, any questions? No. Okay, I make a motion to uh, approve the sale of the Alexander County Treasurer's History Book at a price of twenty dollars with the. Uh, the Board of Commissioners keeping back 12 books uh, just for safekeeping or to for security to pass out. Okay. Can I make that in a motion? Second. second. Okay, have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. Being none, ask for a vote of approval. Aye. Uh, okay, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Hammer. Thank you, sir. That's approved. Everybody rush out and buy one. Okay, moving on to item number seven, uh, designation of voting delegate to NCACC annual conference. Uh, I know, uh, Chairman Yoder, in the past you have done that. Are you uh, willing to do it again? Yes, I'll be at that meeting. Okay, you let me do me. Okay, uh, do we need to vote on that? Yes, sir. Okay, <clears throat> all in favor of Chairman Yoder being our delegate to the conference. I think that's August the 14th, Chairman Yoder, in Wilmington. Uh, yes. Somewhere. Yeah, down. Okay, uh, make a motion that we approve uh, Chairman Yoder for our delegate. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, you're the one. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, <laughs> moving on to uh, item number eight. Uh, resolution by Alexander County Board of Commissioners accepting American Rescue Plan Act funds and I'll recognize uh, County Manager Rick French. Thank you Mr. Chairman. In your packet is a is resolution uh, concerning American Rescue Plan Act funds or ARPA funds. Uh, Alexander County is eligible to receive funding uh, from the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds of H.R. 1319 <coughs> American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 directly from the U.S. Treasury Department. Currently, that's estimated uh, in the total amount of $7,283,353 and has applied for and already received the first uh, transaction of these funds in the amount of $3,641,676.50. Um, and so in another year, we'll receive the rest of the funds. Um, at this time, we'll recommend to the, st to the commissioners to adopt the resolution as presented um, so we can move forward with the process um, to uh, expend the funds. Okay, thank you, Mr. French. Thank you. I make a motion that we approve acceptance of the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Do I have a second? Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, I uh, ask for a vote of approval. Everybody raised hand and Mr. Ah. Uh, motion approves uh, and it carries. Uh, thankful for that. We can Thank you. put it to good use. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, moving on to next item of business, uh, number nine, I believe it's where we're at, yeah. Uh, approval of meeting schedule changes in September and October. Uh, ask Mr. Rick French if you'll yes, expand sir. on that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, the changes that we're recommending for September and October schedule the the September 13th regular meeting to move that to September the 20th 2021 and uh, schedule the October or reschedule the October 4th regular meeting to October 11th so our meeting schedule would change from September 13th to the 20th and October 4th to the 11th that way give us more time between the meetings um, and that's we would recommend that and uh, ask for your approval okay uh, 
make a motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Any questions? Okay. Being none, I ask for a vote of approval. Aye. Uh. Right. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. And moving on to item number 10, uh, board appointments and reappointments. Uh, yeah, recognize County Manager Rick French once again. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, several uh, appointments and also a resolution uh, for the review officer. Um, first, uh, the Hidden Night Fire Department uh, Fire Relief Fund Board of Trustees appoint Chris Stikeleather to replace Grover Sharp. And on the ABC Board, reappoint Donnie Teague for three years. Um, also, review officer, watershed administrator, and floodplain administrator, and subdivision administrator appoint Dustin Millsaps with the COG. And I guess that would be one action, Mr. Chairman. And then we would have to, we would need to, there's a resolution attached that does outlines the review officer in the county, which we would ask you also to be approved this time. But first are the appointments. Okay. All right. Uh, make a motion to approve the appointments as stated. Uh, second. Okay, I have a second from Chairman Yoder. Any, any discussion or any questions? Be none. Ask for a vote of approval. Aye. Uh, right. Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, and then, um, resolution for this again. Yes, Do I need to read that or? No, sir. Okay. All right. I uh, make a motion we approve the resolution requesting the Alexander County Board of Commissioners to appoint a review officer for Alexander County. And that is working through the COG, correct? Yes, sir. Dustin Millsap. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Second. Okay, have a second. Any questions or discussion? Okay. Being none, ask for a vote of approval. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, Jim. Moving on to item number 11. Uh, budget ordinance amendments uh, number one through eight and recognize County Manager Rick French. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, budget ordinance amendment number one is the budget for the remaining balance of the March 2021 contract uh, to expand broadband service in the county. The contract work began fiscal year 2021, but is scheduled to be completed in fiscal year 2022. Budget Amendment 2 is to increase garage budget for higher monthly rent payments effective with the lease renewal uh, on October 1st, 2021. Budget Amendment Number 3 is to increase the sheriff budget for ammunition and flash bangs that were on back order as of June the 30th of 21. Since the items will be received later in the summer or fall, the expenses must be charged to fiscal year 2022. Uh, budget amendment number four is to increase elections department budget for eligible HAVA, and HAVA is Help America Vote Act uh, grant expenses that will be recognized in 21-22 in budget year instead of fiscal year 2021 because the items were on back order and did not arrive in, by June the 30th of 21. Budget Amendment 5 is to increase the sheriff's budget for the use of state funds from distribution of unauthorized uh, substance tax. These uh, special funds must be used to increase law enforcement budget. The funds were received in prior years and will be used to pay for an automatic license plate detection service. And that's Budget Amendment 5. Budget Amendment 6 is to increase the fire emergency services budget for a truck camper shell and lights that were on back order as of June the 30th, 2021. Since the items will be received later in the summer, the expenses, the expenses must be charged to fiscal year 2022. Budget amendment number seven is to budget for stream debris removal at three locations per the emergency watershed protection project 3705 41 from Hurricane Zeta and Etna event. The project will include federal grant funds, federal grant funds from the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service for 75% of the debris removal costs, which is $59,625 and $11,925 of the technical and administrative costs. 
the 25% local match for the debris removal costs, not, which is 19875 will be provided by the state grant funds from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. The state grant funds also include an additional $3,975 that will be used for the 575 of the technical and administrative costs plus the other debris, debris removal costs if necessary. The county has received approval for the project end date to be extended from uh, October 17th of this year to April 15th of next year, 22. And budget amendment number eight is to budget for promotional marketing materials for the county. And I'll be glad to answer any questions about the budget amendments, Mr. Chief. Mr. Vice Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Frick. Any questions for Mr. Frick? Okay. Uh, entertain the motion to approve budget amendments. Second. Okay. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Or further questions? Uh. Okay, we'll vote on the approval now. A little ahead, all right, but we'll get back to it. Okay, uh, if everybody's in approval, I entertain the motion to approve. Raise your hand. Okay. Uh. All right. Budget amendments approved. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next item of business uh, is uh, item number 12. County Manager's report, Mr. Rick Prince. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, Christine Gates, our Senior Center Director for the last 10 years, has retired from the Alexander County Senior Center after 10 years of service. Uh, McGill has notified the county that uh, county staff that the new parking area at Wittenberg Access is nearly complete. I think by now it is complete. Kemp Sigmund Construction Company is doing the work at the park. Uh, also, with in sales taxes uh, through the sales in, from through April of 2021, the county has received five million eight hundred and seven thousand um, dollars, which is 98 percent of the budget collected. We had budgeted five million nine hundred thirteen dollars, and we have two more monthly um, uh, payments, so to speak, uh, to receive. Um, it's almost 19 percent increase from the same time last year. Uh, new sales tax is running uh, right in where it's supposed to be running. It's running about 3.7 percent more. We had budgeted one million, excuse me, one million six hundred eighty-nine thousand eight hundred ninety-seven dollars, and we so far this year we've received a little over 1.5 million dollars. And I'll be glad to answer any questions about the county manager's report. Mr. Mr. Vice Chair. Well, uh, thank you for that information and uh, sales tax increase. That is a good thing for the county. It is. <clears throat> Looks like people are buying local, and yeah, it's a good thing. Keep it. Keep up the good work. Uh, all right. Uh, I guess next thing is the. Uh, any questions for Mr. Mm -hmm. No questions, Chairman Yeager. You got any questions? Right. No, sir, I do not. Okay. Uh, next item will be our approval of consent agenda. And I make that as a motion to approve. It's been in our packets. We've had time to look at it. I'd right, entertain a second. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Being none, I'd ask for approval by raised hand and vote. Aye. Uh, right. Consent agenda is approved. Uh, this will close out the Board of Commissioners meeting and we will move into the uh, Board of Commissioners Consolidated Human Services Board meeting and uh, welcome uh, Ms. Leanne Weston. Thank you, Commissioner. And I would like to add with your approval a uh, COVID update. Okay. I, I'm sorry to have to do that more than you can imagine. We are too. <laughs> I so, know. Yeah. And I had nobody for public comment, by the way. Oh. Um, yes, I am sorry to have to bring a COVID update, but I think you um, 
the community and you need to be aware that we have seen a substantial increase in positive cases, as well as most of North Carolina. I think 75% of counties in North Carolina now are red, and we are in that group, unfortunately. Um, for the last seven days, we've had 75 positive cases. Compared to in June, we were seeing 10 or 12 positive cases a week, just to kind of give you some um, parameters to base that on. So the last seven days, we've had 75. And for the last 14 days, we've had 111. That's certainly not our highest. We were um, several hundred at some points at the worst point, but we are definitely seeing that curve start up. So we want to make sure people are aware and take the precautions that they need to. Um, we still have vaccine, uh, all kinds of vaccine, whatever someone would prefer available in the county. The pharmacies have it, the health department has it. We are seeing more people be vaccinated in the last three weeks, so that's a good thing. We are currently, we've moved up to still not where we want to be, but we're more 36% um, of our population is fully vaccinated. We, we would love to get that to... 50 would be great next goal. Um, we The state is saying, and I've had a lot of people asking, you know, is, is what we're seeing the Delta variant? And the state is not giving us those statistics right now, but they are telling us that 70 to 80% is what we were told last week that was being sequenced is Delta variant. And now today uh, they moved that to 80 to 90%. So it is definitely the Delta variant. We're most, 94% of the cases that the state saw last month was in unvaccinated individuals. But we are seeing some breakthrough of vaccinated. People that have been vaccinated that have a breakthrough though are having milder cases. So you're still not seeing the hospitalizations and deaths. Um, so it's still a, a definitely a true benefit. Um, but people need to take precautions, especially if you have underlying health conditions. If you have family members that are in those situations, um, some people have went back to wearing their mask, especially in indoors, close areas, some of the grocery stores where there's lots of people. If you can't keep that distance, you may want to consider that. Any COVID questions? So on the local level, when there's a test done, test only tells that the person has COVID, not the strand. Correct. And the state is the ones that we send off for public health. Now your rapids that the um, urgent cares and most physicians offices just say positive. You, you don't know what the variant is or which strain it is. The ones that we're sending to the state public lab, they're not testing all of them, but they're doing a percentage. Um, in the next few weeks, they're telling us that they'll let us know that for our county, but right now they're not. Um, they're just giving us the state totals as a whole. Okay. Can you tell with this ramping up of it, the new variant or whatever, does it seem to be uh, people are having a, a harder time with it or does it seem to be about the same as well, what we've really seen, we've only got three hospitalized right now, so we really are not seeing that. We're seeing in that a few individuals. Those people with underlying health conditions are the ones that you're still seeing hospitalized and having serious issues with it. Um, you know, most are, as before, you know, they're... Um, it's it's really hard to say too we've tried to track that you know is it is it this age group of course you know the older individuals do have a harder time they dehydrate more but as far as um healthy you know from from children to adults children don't seem to be nearly as sick they they may they may just have like head colds we're still seeing a lot of people have like it seems like sinus allergies they feel weak a day or two many don't run fever so it's you know, it's just that small percentage that it really hits hard. We've only had one death, like in the last month, which is wonderful. So, so we aren't seeing, you know, high death rates with it um, and high hospitalizations at this point. We hope it stays like that. And I'm hoping that, you know, maybe when school starts back and, and we stop vacationing, we're seeing a lot that are from uh, family get-togethers, the 4th of July, um, out of state, a lot right. of people traveling. I know we've had a few cases come from abroad. Um, 
<clears throat> One more question. The folks that had COVID and has antibodies on the first strand, mm -hmm. are they still getting the second strand? Are they still getting the Delta variant? Mm -hmm. While Some they have antibodies? Small, yes. Yes. Generally, it's, it's only a few that we know of. We are trying to track that. Um, and generally, they're having a milder case. So the antibodies, if you have those. Antibodies, are antibodies are great to have. And the antibodies vary greatly. We have, had, we have seen people that have had antibodies from the disease almost up to a year. We've had some that only kept those less than six months. The average is six months or a little greater. But it varies greatly. I've tried to compare that. Okay, is it somebody with, you know, diabetes or this or that? And it is all over the place. I mean, it is, there's no rhyme or reason to how long your antibodies stay. Yeah. I wish there was. We've, we've tried to pinpoint that, but it is all over the place. So do, you, do you advise? <laughs> Just, it, a lot of it is your immune system. Yeah. If someone has antibodies, should they have the shot also? That is very individual choice. If they have antibodies and they take the vaccine, they are probably going to have more side effects with the first dose. Mm -hmm. It's actually a good thing because you know you're building protection, mm -hmm. but it's not nice that 12 hours that you feel really, really bad. No, no. <laughs> and that's historically. So a lot of people, what a lot of people are doing is having antibodies tests every month or every other month until they see that start to wane, then they're getting vaccinated. A lot of people are saying, well, I'm gonna wait six months. You know, so it's, it's really, you know, if, if individuals need help deciding that, we'll be glad to give them all of their options. Um, all of the pharmacies are doing those antibody tests. We can now do those antibody tests. Our antibody test is a blood draw. The pharmacies is a finger stick. So sometimes it's like, okay, which do you like the least? Because um, <laughs> none of us like needles, right? Um, but, you know, that's an option. It's about $20. So for $20, you can, you know, go see what your antibodies are and it'll give you a level um, and you can see them start to drop and what we recommend is before they're totally gone start your vaccines that way you don't have a a time when you're not protected at some point okay. or at some level okay good question not to keep dragging on but someone who was asymptomatic with mm -hmm. the regular covid is it would they possibly be asymptomatic with the variant or if you, there's no recording of that or you probably aren't going to know that because most people aren't tested unless they there's are. a reason to test um, I mean we can do tests for people that are well but um, generally you, you've got symptoms or you've been exposed you yeah. um, and we see a lot of people that are exposed and if you are exposed and want to be tested the time frame is three to five days after that exposure you've got to give your body time to um, start having some of those antibodies or, or virus in your system. Mm -hmm. Virus, not antibodies. Um, so you really don't want to be tested the day, oh, you know, somebody talked to me and mm -hmm. they went to be tested tomorrow. You need to wait three to five days. But we see a, a fair number that are still negative. Um, it depends on how close, how close to contact. You know, did you wear your mask? Did you not? Did you, you know, it, there's a lot of... Um, reasons your immune system has a lot to do with that um, immune compromised people are much more likely to become ill with less time exposure too so um, the people we worry about are the immune compromised or the people with underlying health conditions especially respiratory if you've got any kind of lung issues those are the ones that are really you know on respirators and um, severe severe illness so really, people with COPD, asthmatics, um, scarred lungs, had lung cancer in the past, anything that would have damaged those lungs need to take great precaution right now. I'm praying it moves out real quick. So. Me too. Trust me. <laughs> I was hopeful at least we would wait till regular flu season because, you know, it's here and we're going to see it kind of like flu is what we hope to get to to where it's not so rampant. All right, good information on that. All right, now to the real agenda.
or the good parts. Chad, next slide. I have good news. We The county has been approved for a dental Duke Endowment Grant. It totals $400,000. We will receive $250,000 in 21, 21, 22, and then the remainder in the next physical year. I want to thank Crystal Adams. She is the CVCC. Um, she is in charge of that dental hygiene program for CVCC and has been very instrumental in helping us and will continue to help us. This is the first between a public health department and a community college. So we're very excited. The collaboration is going to utilize, of course, public health dental staff, but those students as well. So it is a win-win ongoing you know those students have a really hard time finding clinical sites and so this will give them hands-on we are going to provide we've always done dental screenings in the schools um, but we've never done care and so and we're not we're not competing we have talked to all the dentists in the community there is enough work for twice as many as dentists as we have. So we are not trying to take their patients. If students have a dental provider, we want them to continue there. What we're apt to get or looking for is those students not receiving care. We're gonna start with the East and West Middle Schools. We will be able to provide cleanings, x-ray on site. Um, we would, it would be great to eventually get to have dedicated space, but for right now we're gonna be transitioning that equipment in and out because um, there's really not lots of space anywhere um, but we do hope to expand that this next two years is to prove we can do this at east and west and then move to the other schools it would be great to do this in all of them um, and this grant will get us up and running and till we're self-sufficient and we feel like it will be self-sufficient just like the dental clinic has for over a decade so we're very excited about that and we're going to get that information out in the packets when they go out at first in the schools, so parents don't have stuff coming but one time it's just a book the first day of school um so Sounds and we good. probably will not get into the schools to actually start services until about january we've got to get consents and all the startup work done so but we're very excited um we have a public health dental hygienist that will also um, supervise those students as well as CVCC staff. Um, behavioral health program. This one actually I need you to vote on. When we started the behavioral health program, we had the rural health grant that was offsetting any of our 0% um, pay clients. And we do not, that grant ended last physical year. so. To keep this program self-sufficient or as close to self-supportive as possible, we're proposing that you um, not slide lower than 40%. I gave you some examples on the next slide. Um, shows you the fees, our price at 100%. And then what 40% would be, and, and clients can also fall into 60 and 80%. So we would slide no lower than 40, and of course 100% is the top. On the next slide you'll see the incomes, because I wanted you, and I gave you a copy, I didn't put a slide because it's too hard to read, but in your packets you have a slide with all the income levels broken down. This is the income we use for all programs at the health department, family planning, dental, et cetera. But for instance, a family of four with an income between $26,501 and 36438 would fall into that 40% pay or lower. And 100% pay would be that same household with 66250 So that kind of shows you what we're looking at for, for incomes. And you will need to vote on that one. Any questions? We need to vote. No. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes. Any questions, Commissioner Yoder? No, sir. That's a very good program. That's another thing that can, we can use to help our children. Yeah, we need everything we can get. So, uh, I make a move, a motion that we approve the behavioral health. 
income or sliding fee? Is that what the sliding fee? Mm -hmm. As given by Ms. Leanne with Entertain a second. second. Okay, have a second by Commissioner Yoder. Any discussion? Being none, make a motion. Uh, vote of approval. Aye. Uh, motion carries. Thank, Thank you, gentlemen. You gentlemen. The Please. next is uh, just a quick update on the maternal health program. We, Dr. Michael Kepley, has been our um, OBGYN uh, delivering our babies for a long time. I should have looked this up, a long time. Um, prior to that, Dr. Green was here probably 20 years. So, But Dr. Kepley is retiring from obstetrics. He will continue to do gynecology work only. So we, um, he assisted us. We, we did look at several providers, um, but Natural Beginnings Birth and Wellness Center is in Ardell County and they took over Dr. Kepley's obstetrical deliveries for the health department as of July. Um, you'll see on the next page, Dr. Stephen Corsi is their, med is their medical director. Um, and he actually came as well for many years and saw our maternity patients as well. For our clients, they really won't notice much change. The um, Natural Beginnings has um, eight midwives that work in that program. Um, our physician assistant will continue to see our patients on a daily basis. They will be up one to two times a month, kind of like, doc there's really not a lot of change. This is exactly what um, Dr. Kepley did. Of course, he did that prior together. And then Corsi, when he became their medical director about three years ago, he went out of the practice with Dr. Kepley, so it was just Dr. Kepley. But for our clients, they will continue to deliver at Davis Hospital. If it's high-risk clients, they'll continue to go to Catawba Valley Medical Center, so they really won't feel a change. Um, because we felt like the program, due to transportation and lots of issues, we worked really hard to make sure we could continue to provide the care here in this county. We didn't want to have to send people out of county. And that is all of our um, public health. I'm going to do the senior center because, as Mr. French told you, um, Christine Gates is retiring, and Christy Hunt is our interim director for right now. So we wish Christine Gates well in retirement. And we are up to... Social services, I'm going to turn that over to Assistant DSS Director Linda Clements. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you. Appreciate the information. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so for the next slide, um, updates. Uh, just to confirm, the Medicaid transformation of managed care started July 1st. We really have not had any significant issues. We get weekly emails asking if we have issues, um, but we really have not had a whole lot. I'm not sure if you guys have <laughs> heard anything, but we have not. Um, the placements uh, for youth and adults continues to be one of our bigger challenges. Um, we still have, actually we've got more kids that are actually gone out of state than we've had in the past, um, which is really um, frustrating. Um, but we're continued to work with uh, VIA on that, and hopefully that's going to improve along with these tailored plans it talks about in 20. Um, there actually is a contract been in place. I think, I don't know if you saw in the tailored plans that they did pick five or six providers. Um, and the contract was just set for those. This says uh, 2023. It's actually supposed to start being implemented in 2022. I'm sorry about that. Um, we have started work to develop um, our strategies and protocols for the evacuation um, planning based on we've used Red Cross forms and kind of changed them as what we've learned is it is not really a Red Cross shelter until it becomes overnight. Um, so any evacuation shelters were really on the county. Um, we had our last meeting include um, Garrett Huffman, who's been very helpful on this, and the CERT team. So we're going to um, start partnering with them to make sure we have a um, response that's coordinated. 
but he also talked about changes at the state level, which are going to put more emphasis on counties being independent for up to 72 hours in emergency cases. So we'll make sure that we've also planned for that. Um, we were planning to have a celebration luncheon for a year of uh, all the changes that we've been through along with COVID. Unfortunately, with the uh, COVID increasing again now and it's hit our DSS location, we have a number of people out. We are now canceling that and we're gonna wait until things improve as far as uh, COVID. Uh, one thing that's not on this slide, I hope that you all have the opportunity to see um, the Tales Real Times along with um, Gary Herman helped us get information in the newspaper about the HOPE program to help renters who are behind because of COVID. I think it's a great program. We wanna make sure that gets out uh, throughout the community to make sure that we um, are avoiding any evictions that we can. Yeah. Um, next one is, we did have a golden opportunity event. We timed this one perfectly right between when COVID was declining and before the um, Delta variant came back. Um, we had a very nice um, gathering. Um, the seniors all said they greatly enjoyed it. Um, we thank Sheriff Bowman, he came to talk about uh, fraud prevention. The health department was a big hit. They bought little locked uh, medicine boxes that they had on hand for a while and that really went well. The seniors were very appreciative of that. They took those home. Um, and we also had great, um, some good door, door prizes and volunteer recognition. Just wanna thank the people listed on here, which includes town and country drug. Um, these people, um, the sheriff department, um, Western Piedmont Cog, health department, legal aid, senior center, the state's office. Um, they all had tables there and they all donated to the um, door prizes, all these organizations. So we had a nice time. We ended uh, with karaoke at the end, which um, I think that's what you can see them starting to enjoy. Um, so I think all enjoy the opportunity. We've had another opportunity. Um, Leanne helped us apply to March of Dimes. We recently got <laughs> um, <laughs> and picked up, uh, Daniel Fox helped us, went down to Charlotte, picked up a box, um, plenty, um, boxes of sizes two, three, four, and five um, infant diapers along with wipes, and we are distributing them to families in need um, in the community, any family we find out, um, we are making sure that they get those. Um, and Western Piedmont Cog, another sh uh, thank you to them because they did deliver from some school supplies for distribution to our work first clients. Uh, the next thing is just our upcoming actions. Um, we have drafted the position for the new training position and we're waiting for the, um, I think it's the August 13th when we have to um, get that finalized before we post it with the new financial um, year budget. Um, we were unsuccessful, unfortunately. We did try, uh, applied for a grant application for 25,000, hopefully to help the senior program, but we were unsuccessful. They did um, send an email back and said they were overwhelmed with applicants and um, we unfortunately did not meet the, the cut to get that. Um, we've had a few meetings to work on uh, foster parent recruitment and making and getting that more into community engagement. Right now, because of some changes internally, it's kind of on hold. We'll get that moving forward again, hopefully soon. Um, Leanne talked a little bit about um, the retirement for of Christine Gates. We've partnered with the Senior Center. We're actually doing some of our meal delivery from the Senior Center now, the distribution, um, but that allows us to have a staff member at the Senior Center when Christy hunts at Bethlehem so that um, we're helping that coverage and keep the Senior Center open while we actually kind of cover their time and um, for DSS services, but so that partnership, we hope to build on that um, using volunteers even more effectively. Um, I had spoken previously about some collaboration with Via Health and Fostering Health. Some of that, uh, the Via Health still wants to work with us to put a staff member on site, but unfortunately, I don't know if you've heard about all their reorganization and they had a resignation. Uh, the placement of that staff member at our building has also been delayed. Um, 
That's really all I have at this time. Are there any questions or any I do. comments? On uh, foster children and <clears throat> children without homes, what's our current count, or do you know? Children in care. Last I looked, we were at, without homes. Everyone's got a placement. There we had 64 children in foster care. Um, there's three right now that could be joining us shortly, unfortunately. So you said uh, 64? That's last I looked at the number, yes. Is that number about typical where it is, or is that an increase? Or That's higher. We were at pre-COVID, we were in the high 40s. Um, with COVID, court being delayed, so we weren't able to achieve permanence, and people hitting crisis situations and not being able to deal it, it's gone up quite a bit. So we're now in the mid-60s when we were in the high 40s a year and a half ago. So could you say that one more time on the court? Um, during COVID, the court, it sometimes was actually just closed. We couldn't hear cases, which meant they were continued. So we weren't act able to move forward necessarily on any part of the case as far as adjudication or um, reviews and permanence. So yeah. what happens to the child during that time of nothing? We continue with doing our best to get them in services, um, but they make no real move toward permanence, legal permanence, because the court needs to participate in that. Good information. Uh, any other questions? All right. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, I guess that uh, concludes our meeting. We will adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I need a motion to adjourn. To go into closed session. Based on, let's see, where's my little uh, phone? Uh, <coughs> yeah. uh, make a motion to close the uh, consolidated meeting and entertain a motion to go into closed session per NCGS 143-318, 4, 5, and 6, economic development and contractual and personnel information. Second. Okay, have a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh.